In this section, we're going to pick up from the momentum of Section A and work on the pair T test some more and talk about another component of it, the hypothesis testing component. And here's where we'll first define the idea of something that will permeate your life, whether it does in this course or outside of it, when you read research and when you talk with your colleagues and et cetera, something called the p-value. And hopefully by the end of this series, we'll have demystified the Wizard of Oz-like aura about the p-value. But anyway... In hypothesis testing, we want to draw a conclusion about a population parameter. And what we saw before was one way to do that is to create a confidence interval for this population parameter. But another approach is instead of building into the truth from our sample, which is sort of what the confidence interval does, it says, here's my best guess, here's some sampling variation, take me to possibilities for the truth. Hypothesis testing goes in the opposite direction. It says, why don't you specify some possibilities for the truth, the true mean change in blood pressure, and then we'll pick between them using your data from a single imperfect sample. So hypothesis testing generally starts by postulating two mutually exclusive, i.e. there's no crossover, exhaustive, i.e. they cover all possibilities for the truth about the mean change. And the null hypothesis, frequently represented by H and O, and pronounced generally H naught or H O, is generally in these pair designs no difference in the groups being paired. So in our blood pressure or contraceptives example, it's no change in blood pressure after or contraceptive use compared to before. On average. And the alternative hypothesis is the complement of that null. It's a, the very general complement, which is that this population parameter, the average change in blood pressure, is not zero. And what we're going to use in the framework of hypothesis testing is the results from our study to choose one of these two hypotheses. Again, let's talk a little bit more about them. The null hypothesis typically represents the hypothesis of no association or no difference between the groups being compared. So again, in our example, the null hypothesis, we're studying or trying to make a statement about the mean difference in blood pressures after oral contraceptive use for three months versus before, the null would be there's no association between oral contraceptive in use and blood pressure because the true mean difference after and before is zero. The alternative is the very general complement to the null. For example, there is an association between blood pressure and oral contraceptive use, because on average, the mean change is not zero. What we're going to end up doing is testing both hypotheses at the same time, and either rejecting the null and choosing the alternative, or failing to reject the null and sitting with it. And we'll talk more about that as we go through this process. Here's how you do all hypothesis tests. Start by assuming the null is true, assuming that the mean change in blood pressure at the population level is zero. There's no difference in the after mean and the before mean. So we start by assuming the null is true and then ask, well, how likely is the result that we got if the null is true? I, if the truth is there's no change in mean blood pressure after taking oral contraceptives. We got a sample mean change of positive 4.8 millimeters. That's certainly bigger than the null of zero, but it's just an estimate of the true mean. Our sample mean would have to be pretty far from zero to claim the alternative that it's the true mean is not equal to zero is true. But is a sample mean of 4.8 millimeters of mercury big enough to choose the alternative over the null that the true mean, from which we only have a sample representation estimate, is zero. So in other words, we're asking, is our sample result likely or unlikely when the null is true? And if it's unlikely, should we reject the null in favor of the alternative? Well, we need to translate this difference between our observed sample mean and the null of zero into some measure of how likely the result from our sample is. How likely is it to get a sample mean of 4.8 from a random sample of size 10 if the null hypothesis of true mean being zero is true? So what we need is the probability of having gotten such an extreme sample mean as 4.8 if the null hypothesis was true. And this resulting probability is called the p-value. 
If the p-value is pretty high, indicating that our result wasn't that strange if the null were true, we'll probably sit with the null as our choice for the truth. But if this p-value is low, indicating that if the null were true, your sample result is really strange, we'll probably reject the null in favor of the alternative. So what can we turn to to evaluate how unusual our sample statistic is when the null is true? How unlikely is it to get a sample mean of 4.8 from a random sample of size 10 if the true mean in the population is zero? We need some mechanism that will explain the behavior of the sample mean across many different random samples of 10 women. When the truth is, there's no association between oral contraceptives and blood pressure. But we already have that mechanism. It's the sampling distribution of the sample mean that we defined in the last set of lectures. And remember, the sampling distribution is the theoretical distribution of all possible values of x bar from random samples of the same size n. So the theory told us, we defined this in the last se section, we've got a small sample, so it's not quite normal, but it's a t distribution with 9 degrees of freedom, which is more or less a normal curve that's a little wider. And recall from what we learned in the last set of lectures, the sampling distribution is centered at the true mean, the underlying value of the population mean mu. And what are we doing with hypothesis testing? We start under the assumption that the null is true. So under that assumption, the sampling distribution will be centered at mu naught, the null mean which in our case, and in most cases, is zero. So here's the schematic of the sampling distribution of all possible sample means for the differences after minus before in blood pressure from samples of size 10. To compute a p-value using this, we need to figure out or find our value of x bar on the graph here and figure out how unusual it is. Where is x bar equal to 4.8 under this curve? We need to figure out how far the result is from zero, but we can't just plot it on the graph in raw units. We need to, in order to interpret whether it's far or not from zero, we need to put it into standard statistical units so that we can figure out where it falls under this curve. So in other words, we need to figure out how many standard errors 4.8 is away from zero. So, this is what we're going to do to get a p-value. We started by assuming the null is true. We're trying to figure out whether our sample result is likely or unlikely when the null is true. And to do this, we're going to calculate the distance in standard errors of our result from that null mean of zero. This distance, this is one of the worst things we do in statistics. You'll see it called t here. Later, you'll see it called z, etc. The t comes from the fact that sometimes we work off of a t distribution for the sampling distribution, and so the whole test is called a t test, and this number is sometimes called a t, and that's what you'll see in textbooks. It's just a distance. And what we do is measure the raw distance between our observed sample mean difference and the null mean of zero, and then divide it by the estimated units in the standard error. Okay, so in our blood pressure or contraceptive unit, we had a result then ultimately is 3.3 standard errors above zero. Just a distance. We compute how far our result is from the null mean in the standard statistical units of standard error. So we observed a sample mean that was 3.3 standard errors of the mean away from what we would have expected the true mean to be if OC use was not associated with blood pressure. And otherwise, where it's a mean change of zero, that was our null. Is a result 3.3 standard errors above its mean unusual? Well, 3.3 on a sampling distribution, well, that's pretty far out on the right tail. And the p-value that will tell us whether it's unusual or not is the probability of getting a sample result as or more extreme than what we saw away from u equals zero. So basically, the p-value is the proportion of samples we could have taken of size 10 that would give us sample means 3.3 or more standard errors away from zero above when we actually consider below as well if zero were the true mean. So we want that area under the curve shaded in red. We could look this up in the t-table, but the better option is now to let Stata do the work for us. So there is a command called ttestI, and if we supply the summary data from our sample study, in the form of the sample 
size, the sample standard deviation, the sample mean difference, and the hypothesized null mean, which is almost always zero for this type of study, we can get Stata to run our data for us. And if we do this, we get this output here. Notice on that first table, you get at the end the confidence interval that we painstakingly computed by hand in the last section. And then here down below, we get some information related to the p-value. There's a couple things highlighted here. In the upper right-hand shading there, you see t equals 3.2998. That's the distance measure we got, that 3.3 standard errors above zero. And then at the bottom middle here is where we're going to focus our efforts on getting what's called a p-value. So you see there it says ha mean exclamation point equal to zero. Well, that's computer speak for the alternative hypothesis is the mean, the true mean, is not equal to zero. Mu is not equal to zero. And this probability PR of big T greater than absolute value of little t, that's our p-value. That's basically computer speak or shorthand notation for the probability of having something that's 3.3 or more standard errors away from zero in either direction. And the p-value here is 0 0.009. So... When this all settles down, the p-value in this blood pressure oral contraceptives example is 0 0.0092. How do we interpret this? If the truth were the null, that the after oral contraceptives, before oral contraceptives, blood pressure difference is zero millimeters of mercury amongst all women taking oral contraceptives, then the chance of seeing our results, a mean difference of 4.8 or something even less likely in a sample of 10 women, is 9 out of 1,000, 0.0092. So is that likely or unlikely? Well, we still need to choose a course of action. We need to choose between the null and the alternative hypothesis. So we need to decide if our sample result is unlikely enough to have occurred by chance if the null was true. And our measure of this likeliness or unlikeliness is that p-value of 0.009. So, we need to have a cutoff on our head for what constitutes unusual and then compare our p-value to that to decide whether we have an unusual result or not. In general, to make a decision about what p-value constitutes unusual results, there needs to be a cutoff such that all p-values less than the cutoff result in rejection of the null and all p-values greater than or equal to the cutoff, we stay with the null as our choice for the truth. Standard cutoff is 0.05. That's what's used sort of industry research-wide. And we'll talk more about this later in the final section of the lecture. But for now, we'll work with that idea. This is an arbitrary level that says that if things come in at less than 5% likely when the null is true, we'll reject the null. Otherwise, we'll stay with the null. So establishing a cutoff is important for using the p-value to make a decision about which hypothesis to go with for the truth. Frequently, the result of a hypothesis test with a p-value of less than 0.05, or some other arbitrary cutoff, but very frequently it's 0.05. Frequently, the result of a hypothesis test with a p-value less than this amount is called statistically significant. So in our lexicon here, in our semantic, we would say at the 0.05 level, we have a statistically significant blood pressure difference in our blood pressure oral contraceptive example. The changes in blood pressure after oral contraceptive use were computed for 10 women. Paired t-test was used to determine if there was a statistically significant change in blood pressure, and a 95% confidence interval was calculated for the mean blood pressure change after minus before. Blood pressure measurements increased on average 4.8 millimeters of mercury with a standard deviation of 4.6 millimeters of mercury. 95% confidence interval for the mean change was 1.5 millimeters of mercury to 8.1. The blood pressure measurements after oral contraceptive use were statistically significantly higher than before oral contraceptive use. P is equal to 0 0.009. A limitation of this study is that there was no comparison group of women who did not use oral contraceptives. We do not know if blood pressure changes may have risen without oral contraceptive use. And just to reiterate, 
statistically significant we first introduced as a term when our confidence interval for a difference or comparison did not include zero. This term is frequently used when the resulting p-value for the same comparison comes in at less than 0.05. We reject the null in favor of the alternative, a real non-zero mean change. And our results are statistically significant because we're essentially saying that the groups we're comparing are different at the mean level. In our case, the group of women after oral contraceptive use compared to before. So establishing a cutoff is important for using the p-value to make a decision about which hypothesis to go with for the truth. Frequently, the result of a hypothesis test with a p-value of less than 0.05, or some other arbitrary cutoff, but very frequently it's 0.05, frequently the result of a hypothesis test with a p-value less than this amount is called statistically significant. So in our lexicon here, in our semantic, we would say at the 0.05 level, we have a statistically significant blood pressure difference in our blood pressure oral contraceptive example.